Ezekiel chapter number 29. In the tenth year, in the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, so this is inspiration and it's dated. Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now we're moving to Egypt. We just moved from Tyre. We're in Egypt. In between then, we're at, we were at Zion, and then we talked about Israel. Now we're back to Egypt. And prophesied against him. This is the ruler. This is the God king of the nation. They praise him as God, and he accepts the praise. And against all Egypt. Not just the ruler. All of the people. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, God, am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon. Revelation 12, 3. Now, as we, we talked about Satan in 28, we're talking about Satan in 29. Pharaoh is not a dragon. But that missing cherub of chapter 28, he comes back as the dragon in Revelation 12, that old serpent. You got to be careful when I'm speaking about Satan because he does not want himself to be revealed to everybody. He wants to be that little red little guy with a pitchfork and a cute little smile on his face. But when you start discussing the fact is, when you start getting the dragon tree, is that the word? Into dragons, China, games, wizardology, if that's, the game, if that's the word. And you start getting into serpents, you know, you're getting in the realm of Satan. Now I'm going to tell you, and you look at the reptiles. Frogs, great in-depth study would be of the plagues that were gods of the Egyptians that lieth in the midst of his rivers, that would be the Nile, which has said, my river is my own and I have made it for myself. Who proclaimed to make that entire river? The Pharaoh. He proclaimed himself as a God, as a creator. I made this river, not God. <coughs> and I'm talking about God of the Bible. He is taking credit for what God had done. And that Nile River is one of the chief gods of the Egyptians along with the sun. That's where their food came from. That's where their water came from. That's where their agriculture came from. Now we're going to get into some more interesting little things here. See, you got to study the Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that he is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, let's go. But I will put hooks in thy jaw. I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stink unto thy scale. Stick unto thy scale. I will bring them up out of the midst of the river, of thy rivers. And all the fish of thy rivers shall stink a stick. Onto thy scale. Now you just go reading through that and you, you put that to Pharaoh, right? God's talking to Pharaoh. Can you find me one Pharaoh that had scales? Did you miss that? He says, Ezekiel, I want you to speak to the king of Pharaoh. Okay, Lord, sure. All right, I want you to tell him that the fish are going to stick to his scale. Now you read that and you think, well, he's talking about the fish scale. No, he's not. He's saying the fish are going to stick to you, buddy. Now, I'm going to leave you the little study on your own, but let me say, I will put hooks in thy jaws. S. Job 41, verse 2. Leviathan. Match that reference. I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scale. Job 
41 verse 5, Leviathan. That one where the scholars call the crocodile or the hippopotamus. You lost your cross-reference in Ezekiel 29. You lost your cross-reference in Ezekiel 28. You know what Tyre and Egypt are, are symbols of? That government that is coming by Satan. You may think you have Satan in the White House right now. You ain't got Satan in the White House right now. First of all, if you had Satan in the White House right now, most great odds would be I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. So God has leaped over the king of Tyre, the prince of Tyre. God has leaped over the pharaoh king of Egypt and says, Satan, I'm talking to you. Ridiculous, isn't it? Oh, Lord, we have never, never let you. Peter, no. Satan, and he turned and talked to Peter. He dressed Satan through Peter. Ezekiel twenty-eight, Ezekiel twenty-nine, and when Peter, and when Jesus addresses Peter, tells you God speaks to Satan through a man. And. Peter loved the Lord and wanted to do right, but he's wrong. And I will leave thee thrown into the wilderness. What would you think a reptile thrown into a wilderness will end up? Revelation 19:17. Thee and all the fish of thy rivers, thou shalt fall upon the open field. Thou shalt not be brought together. Or get brought together, nor gathered. No one's going to put you together, and no one's going to gather you. You'll be all by yourself. I have given thee for meat to the beasts of the field, and to the fowls of the heaven. Well, maybe there he's talking about Pharaoh, but still, no life in the wilderness for anybody. That's why it's called a wilderness. You know how you knew God loved the Jews and took care of them? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they lasted 40 years in a place called wilderness that cannot provide for you. You don't read about a little house on a wilderness, do you? And all the inhabitants of Egypt shall know that I am the Lord. When they kick, when he, when God kicks the Egyptians, God. To know that I am the Lord, because they have been a staff of reed to the house of Israel. Now, the staff of reed, Second Kings eighteen twenty one, and Isaiah thirty six verse six. It's read a little bit further. It's leaning. You know what a reed is? It, it's a plant. It's a leaf. It's an export of Egypt. All right, about this staff of reed, and you just read the Bible without reading the Bible, and you miss so much. When they took hold of thee by thy hand, thou did break. And rend all their shoulder. And when they lean upon thee, thou breakest. And made all their loins to be at a stand. You're looking at a cane. The symbol is a cane. But it's not made of wood. It's made of a leaf. And that they went to go trust on it. And boink, they ended up on the floor. They ended up with a broken shoulder. They ended up with a broken hand. The entire hand and shoulder has been disabled because of the of relying on Egypt. Israel was made broken by Egypt instead of relying on God. Now, 
get yourself a nice tall leaf when you've injured your leg and use that as a walking cane to see how far you're going to get. Make a pair of crutches out of leaves and then try to walk out of the hospital without entering back into the hospital. That's what it's saying. That staff that Israel trusted upon, who is Satan and Pharaoh, did them more harm than it did good. And God is going to rebuke Egypt because they let Israel rely on them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring a sword upon thee, and cut off men and beasts out of thee. And the land of Egypt shall be desolate and waste, and they shall know that I am the Lord, because he has said, The river is mine, and I have made it. Do you know what you do when you take credit for what God has done when it comes to creation? Let's call it the science of evolution. You anger God. When you, sit, when you don't give God the credit for making a tree or the earth, the solar system or whatever it is, or you keep on spending money, taxpayers' money, to try to disprove God, to find water somewhere out there in the universe, that that's the form of life, you are angering God. Let me ask you, what one spaceship of the United States of America, who is a Christian nation, never mind Russian, they're atheists, remember? So where is a Christian nation? What any space thing that we sent into outer space, failure or success, have we named of anything from Genesis to Revelation? Not one. You know what we've named them after? Gods and goddesses. Well, they sent up an image of a man and a woman, you know, Adam and Eve. Yeah, you can find a man and a woman in every religion. Called sex. Behold, therefore I am against thee and thy rivers, that's their God. And I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate, from the tower of Serene, even unto the border of Ethiopia. No foot of man shall pass through it. And I got question marks here. This is Zechariah 14, verse 18. I don't know. Read it. You think it fits? Fits. If it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit. Question mark. Nor foot of beast shall pass through it. Neither shall it be inhabited forty years. Jeremiah. Uh, what is this? No, yeah, no, okay, never mind. And I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate. Her cities among the cities that are laid waste shall be desolate forty years. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations. I will disperse them through the countries. You read commentaries, they'll give you dates and ideas and stuff like that. I don't know. Yet, thus saith the Lord God, at the end of forty years will I gather the Egyptians from the people whether they have scattered. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt, and will cause them to return into the land of Hazor, into the land of their inhabitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall be a basis of kingdom. Neither, uh, that's the beginning. That's the foundation. Neither shall exalt itself any more above the nations. That's Egypt today. There are nations there. They have had a bunch of children. They have a bunch of grandchildren. They have moved themselves out to a tribal people and a group of people. But they are no more on top of the world again. You realize Egypt in the, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, that was the nation of all the nations to go back with the fewest nations that there were. And I will, I will diminish them, and they shall no more rule over the nations. They just rule themselves, even now they're having a hard time doing it themselves. They have no power to take over Africa. They have no power to take over Israel. They have no power to take over the Middle East. 
They're just concerned about Egypt. And shall be no more the confidence of the house of Israel. Israel is not relying on them today. Which bringeth their iniquity to remembrance. When they shall look after them. But they shall know that I am the Lord God. And it came to pass in the seventh and twentieth year. In the first month, in the first day of the month. The word of the Lord came unto me saying. Again, inspiration dated. Son of man. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Jeremiah 43, 8-11 Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. The attack upon the Tyrus. Yet he had no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus was the service Jeremiah 43.10 Tyrus was the service that he had for serve against it. Nebuchadnezzar's army did not get no spoil when they attacked Tyre. They didn't go around looting. There was nothing for, for the ba uh, Babylonian army to grab. Yet God told them, I want you to go to Tyre. I want you to destroy it. They, remember, they took everything and moved out to the island. And they just waited for Alexander to grow up and do his deed. So what it looks like it was told that when Tyre moved out to the, to the Mediterranean Sea as an island, it looks like they took everything with them that Nebuchadnezzar never got a shot. And his army was peeled. His army was bald. There was drastic battles there. Look it up. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will give the land of Egypt into, unto Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He shall take her multitude, and take her spoil, and take her prey, and it shall be the wages for his army. So when you tell on the billboards, Thou shalt not kill. I can't go to war because I'm a Christian. I'm a person of the Bible, and I don't believe in wars. God says, I sent an army into to a nation, and you know what? That army wasn't paid, so I sent them into another army, and I said, there's your payment. Thank you very much. What do you say about that? And thou shalt not kill, and then warfare. Now, you can just imagine Nebuchadnezzar's army. Oh, we went over there entire man. There was nothing to bring home. The wives and children. Dad, did you bring nothing? No, we didn't have nothing. Honey, what did you bring me from Tyre? Couldn't find nothing. We went over there and fought that stupid war. And, you know, I was injured. And men were killed. And we didn't get nothing. You know, God heard that because he says about the Israelites in, in Egypt. I hear their cry. And God says, you know what? Yeah, you know what? They didn't get no pain. Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to call your troops. Yes, sir. Call the troops. Call the army. What are you going to do? I want you to go down to Egypt and you're going to find your paycheck for doing what you, I wanted you to do in Tyre. God paid an army for doing two battles. One didn't get paid. The other one got paid for the, what, the other one he did not get paid. I have given him the land of Egypt. Now I wonder if this is interesting. The fact is that Jeremiah was carried away captive by his people into Egypt when God said not to go. And he says, I want you to go by the built the brick kiln. Remember that? He says, I want you to prophesy to these people saying, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come here. He's going to destroy this land. I don't know. I One of these is the two instances prophesied by Ezekiel and Jeremiah the coming of Nebuchadnezzar's army. And if it is, I don't know. Ezekiel and Jeremiah, man, they are just parallel in two different places, preaching the same message that God has to two different men in two different places about one event. Jeremiah tells them, hey, now that we're here in Egypt, guess who's coming? That army you were afraid of. And Egypt, they're going to kick your butt. Ezekiel, I want you to tell them, guess where Babylon's going? They're going to Egypt and they're going to kick some butt. That's exactly, I don't know, maybe these two do line up. I'm just trying to do chapter by chapter 
study with the basics of what each chapter talks about. But I was thinking, Jeremiah said the same thing. And I got, but I got dates in my Bible, and some of them I've been told are wrong, and some are, they don't know, and stuff like that. So, scripture with scripture, Ezekiel and Jeremiah talked about Babylon coming into Egypt. Now, was it the same battle at the same time? That would be a more in-depth study. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's not. I have given him the land of Egypt for his labor, wherein he served against it, because they wrought for me. Who's the me? Save the Lord God. So you better be careful when you hold the Bible and say, Thou shalt not kill. That means you don't go to war. When God told those Israelites, he says, before you go in that land, I want you to take every one of those nations, the, the Hittite, the Canaanite, you go with all the Pesachites and all that. I want you to go in there. I want you utterly and completely and annihilate men, women, children, and all the idols and all the gods and everything. And David said, even the horses. Because that was part of the sex worship. Quite interesting. Because here we stand in 2015. We're having a religious war right now. And the Congress and the President of the United States has no idea what to do. And the Bible says what to do. You declare war and you completely, utterly destroy. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah? You have no idea what the Bible is meaning in that. God has given a nation, not a person, not an individual. I have no right to go kill Catholics. I have no right to go kill Islam. I have no right to go kill uh, anybody who's against the Bible. But if my nation calls me and says, I want you to sign up at your recruiter's office tomorrow morning because we're going to go to war against Islam, God has proclaimed that a nation can proclaim war against another nation you just better know which nation is God standing on and which nation is God against now if I was if I was an Egyptian and I were to find out that God's against me I would run to Babylon and join their army right now today you wouldn't know whose army to be in today but to say that, you know, I would be disqualified for war service because I'm a Christian, you are a phony and a liar. Because the best men in the Old Testament were warriors. David. Joshua. 80-year-old, if not 90-year-old, Caleb. Abraham was, took part of a war. Two of them, maybe. Nation against nation has not to do with thou shalt not kill. Plus, thou shalt not kill was written for the Jews, with the Jews, it's the Jewish. Egypt had done Israel wrong. God says, get in there, I've already judged them, and now put the sentence forth. Now, Babylon is going to be judged by God, and God is going to sentence them by the Medes and the Persians. And then the Medes and Persians are going to be judged, and they'll be sentenced by the Greeks. Well, how can you say that you can't have a war when God said, because they wrought for me, and it's been a warfare, saith the Lord God. The cup of Tyre had reached to its fullest, and God says, because of their sin. And what's the Bible say of sin? The wages of sin is death. In that day will I cause the horn, that's the strength, strength of an animal, 
of the house of Israel to bud forth. Now, a horn does not bud. I have not ever seen, in my times, ever seen deer walking down the street with, with, a, with a rack and having little flowers on it. Now, maybe bud forth is a term used how they grow. I don't know, but I take the word bud as like a flower. Grow. Bud would be life. You know, they carried horns back then of, of rams and all that. They used them as, as trumpets. They used them as, to carry uh, uh, all kinds of things. Aaron had a staff that was dead, and one day it had flowers and almond trees, uh, almond nuts. It can be dead, and yet God can give it life. And I will give thee the opening of the mouth in the midst of them. I don't know. The them would be the Egypt. I don't know. Opening of the mouth is the fill. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And I got a note here, Exodus 3 19. They were supposed to know that he was the Lord God back in Exodus. You realize Egypt has been judged again? Because it's Israel's failure. God told them and it's written in the law. And they have a copy of the law. Don't go to Egypt. Sorry we're not going to listen to you. You know what Egypt should have done? Get out of here. Get your butt back to your land. Get yourself back to your God. You see those pile of frogs over there? You see that missing monument over there? Yeah, what's about that missing? That's the pharaoh that drowned in that river. That's that sea. Get your butt out of here. We don't. Egypt says, listen, after all the trouble that you guys got, get out of here. No. The money's good. The credit's good. Come on in our land. Come on. You're welcome. You know how the Jew, you know how you know the Jews were not living right? They were welcoming them. The Egyptians say, come on in. We try to preach and try to do good at the farmer's market in Daytona. And you know what? They won't let us into their fair and their market. We must be doing something they don't like, that they don't want us there. Now, if we were worldly Christians, oh, come on in, yeah, buy our watermelons. Buy, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, because you're not going to say nothing about God. You're just, you know how many Christians probably walk in and out of that place and they wouldn't even know they're Christians and then do business? And again, we see over and over through Ezekiel and Jeremiah that there's going to be another exodus of the Jews out of Egypt after Egypt gets their butt kicked. Neither the Jew nor the Egyptian learned their lesson. You know what history, what's, I, I forget how they completely say it, but history, history's not learned something like that. It will repeat itself and it goes around in a vicious circle. Now, if it is, if the dates are correct, I don't know that they are. I'm not going to say the guy's right. I'm not going to say the guy's wrong. If I'm wrong and I'm right. But when if I go to Exodus in my Bible under the date I got there, and I'm going to take Exodus 20, and then go over. Moses is in the mount. And let me check Exodus. Let me go to. Okay, this is seventh journey. Let's see. Blood, 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 blood. Let's see. If I go to Exodus, all right, all right I'm right going to put that on it out. King Pharaoh and Moses. All right. If I go to Exodus 12, I got a date here, 1491 BC. I'm right, supposed to say BC 1491. If I take Ezekiel here, I got 588 BC. BC 588. Within a thousand years, plus or minus, you're back in the same condition they were back in Exodus 12. Or before Exodus 12. They're back in, they're back in Egypt. And they're doing business like they were doing with Joseph. 
buying and selling, living and making children. And when God called them out, he, said, he put in the law, he said, don't go back. And look where we are. And we've done a further study with Ezekiel and Isaiah to find out the gods came with them. We found it with Joshua. They brought the gods with them. Where did uh, Aaron get the idea of a, of a calf? Of all That was an Egyptian god. See, Israel never left Egypt even though they left Egypt. They left physically, but they, most of them didn't leave spiritually. When they grabbed all their goods that they had, some of those stuff was Egyptian item. And then some of the people that went with them were Egyptians. That's why, the God, that's why God tells you in the Bible, you've got to have a division. You've got to separate yourselves from them. When Abraham, God says, I want you to get away from your family. I want to get you away from your home. I want you to go. He took Lot and Abraham had troubles and problems until Lot was separated. Israel never got rid of Egypt. Egypt never got rid of Israel. And they're going to get their butt kicked again. Israel's already in captivity in Syria. They're no more. Well, they're, I don't mean no more. As far as right now, even to present day history, they're, they're scattered. Judah already with Ezekiel, has been taken in captivity. There are two more captivities coming. And then Judah and Jerusalem are sacked, gone, unto Ezra and Nehemiah. And yet today, they are scattered. And they're not even in their homeland. And they don't have a temple. They don't have a king. They don't have what God has promised them. But notice, they're not running to Egypt. That's it. And Egypt's there. Egypt is a is a country. Egypt is, is, is running. Egypt is a land that everyone vast for historical evidence, historical diggings, archaeology. And everyone's running over there to find out what's the pyramids, what's the solar, what's all these mysteries. But who's not running over there according to Ezekiel 29? Israel. Israel said, no, 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 no. We don't have anything to do with them. We've had it with it. With, Israel did learn their lesson here. They don't go back to Egypt. But they have not relied on Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's their step right now. So we see here the reason why. But another remarkable thing is for the future to see the fact is we've seen a nation called Tyre. We've seen a nation uh, Zidon. We've, we've covered uh, Edom, Philistines, Moab, Egypt, and we've seen Satan. And when Satan was upon the mount with, with Jesus Christ, he said unto me, if you will fall down, I'm not quoting completely, he said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I will give you all these. And Jesus never rebuked him. And you got to understand, there's two phrases of government figures today. There are government figures who, who go in, they do their job. All right? There are government figures who have fallen down, and then when, when they are in their power, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, they are in the power of Satan. Now, who they are today, I don't know. I'm not even going to try to guess. So if you got people working in government who the Bible can reference to them as maybe the power of Satan, is that any place for a Christian to be in? When the bit what, what do you think of what's the first thing you think of if I were to say, all right, word association, I say hi, you probably say low. If I said red, you would say green. If I would say politician, what was the first thing you thought of? You thought of a liar or a cheat, didn't you? Something to that thing. Run yourself to John 8, 44 and find out who the father is. I was asked at work last night by one of the people, one of the people I work with. I'm going to ask you a big question. What's that? I says, 
what are you who are you going to vote for for the presidential campaign? I said I don't vote. I just probably just turned off the tube of everybody in America now. I said I don't get me I don't get in that mess. Why not? I said I'll tell you very number two reason. I said I've heard those guys. I said I can go back and I, as far as Jimmy Carr is I can recommend to my mind, but he mean for. I can go back to every one of those guys and listen to all their campaigns, listen to all their promises, and not one thing would fulfill. In my book, they're a liar. I rather stay with the truth. Sanctify them through, through sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. You want me to go stand up or do anything for a guy who openly lies? You know? I don't get involved in politics. I don't get involved in government. Only what the Bible shows me. Now, if, if I'm going to lose crown because I don't vote, okay, oh well. I'll take that. But I am rest assured to know that there are some leaders in this country right now that God said, I even know there are some Christians that follow God, follow Jesus Christ. Hey, that God addresses Satan in them until they get right. But I do know one thing for sure. There was a president I voted for, and he had some actions against the Jews. Not, not big ones or anything like that. But some, you know what? You know what I thought about that after I did that? My vote put that guy in office. I don't ever want to put a tally mark for somebody who's going to go against the Jews in any right claim or form. That guy started a war with one man, and I never saw any evidence of weapons of mass destruction at all. Sorry. That was his main banner. You could have got him for any other reasons. But I'll leave the government between God and Satan. That's their job. I'll do what the Bible tells me to do. I will pray for the leaders. I will witness to the leaders. And I'll stay out of their business. They stay out of my business, I'll stay out of their business. I obey the law, I don't need to worry about them. Romans 13. And where Satan is, where government figures here, I don't want to be there. I got enough problems trying to find what churches are around here and what churches all that. Satan has his, his ambassadors in the pulpit. Never mind, let's not worry about the government. You know? Government's not a thing to get into for me in the Bible. And a lot of you may disagree, that's perfectly fine. You're wrong, we know it. And but I see these things about here. I, I, I see I see Babylon taking Israel captive and I'm going I know I'm going on a rabbit train on this one, I'm sorry, but you ever read one place where Jeremiah and Ezekiel rose up a protest, a tea party? We're gonna vote Nebuchadnezzar out. We're gonna get a new king. I don't I don't see them doing that. I don't see one man of God protesting against the government in any way, shape, or form. I don't see any man in the Bible voting for a new leader of a nation. I don't see it in the Bible. I don't see Peter Payne, Peter Payne, Peter James or John or Paul protesting or arguing against Nero while he's using Christians as the candlelight for his barbecue that night. But I see them telling me I'm obey the powers that be and I'm to pray for the powers that be. I am to do well to the powers that be. That's why I see what God tells me through his people. 
Moses is the only one that stood up against the, the government. That's the only man under the power of God. I had not been called to do that. 